Good morning. Good morning, Word of Life. Before we jump in, I first just wanted to um, say that this week has been a rough week for our community, and we were devastated by the news of Ava Wood's family, and we just wanted to make mention of it this morning and know that it has impacted our community, probably impacted several of you in this room, and that... um, I know that Pastor Eddie's been working a lot with some of our students that were affected, but I would like it if just before we even get into this, that we could just pray as, um, uh, tr- as the church, just pray for this family and lift up our community. So if you wouldn't mind just praying with me this morning, God, we just pray over the Wood family, God, and all those that have been impacted and affected by this tragedy, God. God, we pray that your um, presence, your spirit would be felt. God, we pray for comfort and peace upon those who um, knew Ava, knew her family, and are impacted, God. God, we don't understand why, behind what the why is behind this tragedy. It's just so heartbreaking. But God, we know that you're a loving God who cares. And you see every single person that is hurting right now, God. And I pray that you would bring comfort to their hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you guys this morning. This is week three of our worship series. Started a couple weeks ago. I hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have. It's been truly an incredible service, and I've been so impacted to see how um, our time of worship has been going after our messages and just the powerful words that have been spoken. The first week, we talked about what is worship, and then the second week, we talked about, which was last week, intimacy and communion and how it relates to worship. Well, today... I, or this weekend, I've been kind of doing the solo parent thing. My parents have been so amazing. They've jumped in and helped. But my husband is out of town. Tom is out of town. He is going back to the glory days of when he was a youth pastor. And he's hanging out with the youth students at winter retreat. So he's coming back today, probably exhausted because he's old now. Um, And he's not here to defend himself, but he is old. And he is probably exhausted from it, but loving it. It, He loves spending time with the youth. But I miss him. Do you know, you know what that, you know what it's like? Like when your spouse goes away and some part of you is like, I get to catch up on all the shows they don't like to watch. But then another part of you is like, ah, yeah, but I really miss spending time with them. I miss being with them. And it's the same with my kids. When I put my kids on the bus in the morning and I say goodbye to their little faces, it doesn't matter if it has been the worst morning. If they have just made the morning so difficult, as soon as I put them on that bus and I go off throughout my day, I can't wait to see them again. Because I love them and I care about them and there is value in spending time with them. There is relationship building that happens when I spend time with them. And it only comes by being in the same space together. So I miss it when it's not there. It is the same with God. When we are absent or we haven't spent time with God, we should feel that same sense of longing of, I can't wait to get back into his presence. I can't wait to spend time with him. I can't wait to feel him near me. Sometimes I think... We treat God like he is a long-distance relationship. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever been in a long-distance relationship or you've ever observed a long-distance relationship or maybe you're kind of doing the long-distance thing right now. But it is hard. It is hard to do long-distance. You know, Tom and I have only ever done it once, and it was right before we got engaged, and we were living in Australia, and we both went home to our home country. So he was in the UK, I was in the US, spending time at Christmas with our families. And I just remember every day thinking, man, I wish he was here so he could see this. I wish he was here so he could be a part of this part of my life, so he could see, meet my friends, so he could be a part of my day to day. 
And I would like almost log in my head of the things that I wanted to tell him. And then the difficult, difficulty and challenges of trying to find in our schedule when a time worked when we could find time together because oftentimes it just so happened he was out with his friends when I had time and I was out with my friends when, when he had time and it just kind of went back and forth. But our relationship with God, it doesn't need to feel like a long distance relationship because we can be in God's presence at any time. We have access to his presence at any moment. And his presence is essential to our relationship with him. So this week we are talking about the value of his presence. So when was the last time you sought after God's presence? Hopefully it was this week. The last time that you just sat in his presence. That you felt his presence. Because we have access all the time. I hope it's every day. I hope it's multiple times every day. I can be in my car, in the grocery store, with my kids going crazy at home, on my worst day, on my best day, and even on all the in-between days, and I can be in his presence. And so can you. I don't have to wait until Sunday to have access to the presence of God. His presence isn't just ushered in when the worship band starts. We can be in his presence at any moment. Earlier this year, we talked about Beyond Sunday, and we kind of launched into this and said, we want to take church beyond Sunday. We want to grow in our relationship with God, and it has to go beyond Sunday. It can't be just Sundays where we are growing and where we are hearing from God and where we are applying things to our life. It goes the same for worship. Worship goes beyond Sunday. We have to find time for his presence. Hyatt says, someone is noted that when we pray, We are preoccupied with our needs. When we praise and give thanks, we are preoccupied with our blessings. But when we worship, we are preoccupied only with God. When we worship, we are preoccupied only with God. In worship, we focus on just being with God, being near him. In God's presence, our intimacy with him grows. We grow in our relationship with him. We have to be in the presence of those that we want to grow in our relationships with. Same with God. We need more time where we are preoccupied only with God. God's presence is freely given, but easy to take for granted. His presence is freely given, but easy to take for granted. Let's go ahead and pray. God, I just pray right now over this time that we have together this morning. God, I pray against any distractions. God, I pray that right now, God, that we would sense your presence in this place. That we would know that you are here. God, that even if this is the first time this week that we've taken time to think about being in your presence, God, I pray that right now we would feel you in this place. God, we just pray right now over every single person in this room. God, that they would know that you are here this morning. They would feel you in their, they would feel your presence. They would hear you speaking to them this morning. And that this service, God, that you would move in it, God. God, that the words that you want spoken would be spoken. And the words that you want to be heard would be heard. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So God's presence is freely given, but easy to take for granted. In the Old Testament, The Israelites longed for God's presence because it wasn't easily accessed. They would do anything to be in God's presence. 
They believed that there was power in God's presence, and they longed to be close to God. We can easily take it for granted because it is so freely accessed. So back in the Old Testament, when Moses left Egypt and he delivered the Israelites from Egypt, there was this time where they went to Mount Sinai. And while they were at Mount Sinai, that's where the Ten Commandments came and then instructions. Well, Moses was asked to come up on the mountain. God said to him, come up on this mountain. And while he was up on that mountain, God gave him instructions. And he told him to go back down the mountain and to build the Ark of the Covenant. He said, I want you to build this Ark, and that is where I will reside. That is where you will find me. That is where you will speak to me. And that is where you will sacrifice so that you can hear my voice. This, is, this was all happening through Moses and through the people of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we get into Exodus. And this is what it says. It says, place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the ark of the covenant. For there I will give you commands for the people of Israel. And this is what Mounts has to say about that passage. He says, it's more common use is in Israel's worship. Where it denotes the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord empowers a craftsman, craftsman named Bezalel who makes the Ark of Acacia wood 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. The Ark is a chest in which the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, the testimony, are placed. Its cover is called the mercy seat on which two cherubim are stationed. There God's presence will manifest itself and he will commune with his people. As noted in number seven, whenever Moses went in the tabernacle to speak with the Lord, he heard his voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rests on the ark of the covenant. The Lord spoke to him from there. The ark is placed in the tabernacle's most holy place behind the inner veil and is anointed by Moses. Because God's presence cannot be taken lightly, access to the ark is severely restricted. It is there that the blood of the atonement is applied and forgiveness is granted. The ark of the covenant housed God's presence. That they knew that that's where they could find God's presence. That's where God would speak. However, it was also very restricted. It was put in the tabernacle and was not easily accessed. It required the proper amount of reverence. It was not easily accessed. We see the Ark of the Covenant through the Old Testament where they're crossing over the Jordan. As soon as the Levites carrying the Ark of the Covenant go into the Jordan River, the waters part. And suddenly the Israelites are able to go across the water. But as soon as God's presence left the water, what happened? The water went back. The Ark of the Covenant surrounded Jericho. They were surrounding the, spirit, or the, the city with his presence and worshiping. And then the walls came down. They were walking circles around the city. They were putting God's presence, taking God's presence around the city. It was surrounding it. David danced in the presence of God and celebrated when the ark was returned to Jerusalem. He celebrated. He couldn't wait for God's presence to be back where it was supposed to be, to have access to his presence. David went into the tabernacle, God's presence, after his son died to be able to worship him. He went straight into God's presence. He knew that's where he needed to be. We need God in every season. We need to actively pursue God's presence. We need to engage in his presence. We need to long for his presence. Worship makes God's presence a priority. Worship makes God's presence a priority. God's presence came at a price for the Israelites, and Jesus paid the ultimate price. His presence came at a price. 
the ark came at a price for the Old Testament people. They had to build the ark. They had the cost of the constructing of the ark. The inconvenience of setting up and tearing down the tabernacle every time they camped out to place the ark of the covenant in there. The multiple sacrifices that they had to offer to be able to be in God's presence, to be able to hear his voice. And the, mo and the stress of carrying the ark everywhere. They had to carry the ark everywhere they went. You know, recently, I don't know about you, but do you guys search Marketplace in here? Do you guys go on Facebook? Or maybe it's um, Craigslist or OfferUp or I don't know what all the other ones are called. Um, but looking for just used items to purchase. Well, I like to do this. I like to go on there and look for kind of like antique things and stuff. Well, recently, my husband and I, we bought a brand new mattress. Not from one of these sites, but brand new. So we bought a brand new mattress, and it was one of those mattresses that, like, does that really cool thing where it comes in a box, and then you take it out, and it's, like, magically, like, inflates, and you're like, how does that even happen? It was one of those. And so when it kind of inflated and we looked at it, it was, like, slightly deformed. Like, there were some, like, slight deformities with it. And, you know, when you buy something brand new, you want it to come perfect. You want it to look brand new. So I reached out to the company, and I just said, hey, like, it came a little deformed. They asked for pictures. I sent pictures. They get back in touch with me, and they said, hey, um, we're going to send you a brand new mattress, but we want you to dispose of that mattress. You can either toss it or give it away. So... I put it up on Craigslist, or not on Craigslist, sorry, Marketplace, and I said, here's a free brand new mattress. Has a couple of defects, but you really can't see them. And of course, I got a lot of uh, people reaching out to me for it. And the person who ended up coming and getting it, he reached out to me and his questions were, so it's free. It doesn't cost anything, but it's a brand new mattress. Very skeptical, which I get. And he, then he's like, well, what are the defects? And I'm, so I'm explaining the defects. I won't go into details here. It's boring. But anyways, they were very small. You really couldn't see them. Didn't affect the, how comfortable the mattress was. And he says, you really don't want any money for it, though. I'm like, no, because I already paid for my mattress. I'm getting my mattress. So this one's free. And so I thought I'd just give it away. And he shows up, and he's all happy. But we all understand, right, that we understand, or we associate cost with worth. So if something is free, we want to know why it's free. It's like, you know, there's all so many things out there, right? They say they're free. They aren't really free, you know, or when you think of free, you think of the quality. Well, also, when Elijah was a little baby, he was about 12 months old, we had some friends, and the wife worked for a very wealthy, com uh, yeah, wealthy family who she nannied for. And so when the kids would, um, would, they wouldn't be able to fit in the sizes of clothing anymore, she would, the mother would give them to my friend, and she would say, go and give these to whoever you want. Well, we were the beneficiary of a lot of these clothes when Elijah was little. A lot of them came with still the tags on. And let's just say they were like very expensive clothing, like $100 shirts for 12-month-olds. Um, and so we would regularly dress Elijah in these $100 shirts, but then with like the $6 pants that we bought. <laughs> so he would, be, he would, yeah, he would be wearing all this like expensive, like I don't know what brands they are, um, clothing on top and then like Walmart pants. And um, so, but we... The cost for us was in the pants, right? Because we, what we got was free. The shirts were free. So they didn't cost us anything. So his pants were more expensive to us because that's what we paid for. But the shirt was more valuable. We associate free with cheap. We think that if it is free, then it must be cheap. God's presence is free, but it's not cheap. Jesus died so that we may have access to his presence. That's not cheap. It's free, but it's not cheap. 
And this was promised long ago. In Jeremiah 3, it says, In those days when your numbers have increased greatly in the land, declares the Lord, people will no longer say, The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It will never enter their minds or be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. And then Expositor's Dictionary has this to say about that verse. It says, In the time of their restoration to the land, the Lord's people will increase greatly. The phrase in those days clearly refers to the messianic times. In other words, when Jesus is coming. In that era of blessing, no one will even mention the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. The worship of God will need no visible aids, for God will dwell among his people. The Ark was the center of the religious life of God's people and the place where the high priest offered the blood of the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. The old economy is to be dissolved The old covenant, of which the ark was a central feature, is to give way to another. See, the promise is that one day you won't need the ark to experience the presence of God. One day the Messiah will come and everyone will have access to his presence. New Testament believers, that's us too, are living the fulfillment of this promise. We don't have the cost associated with the presence of God like the Old Testament people of God did because of what Jesus did for us. That doesn't make it any less costly. Just because we're not paying the cost doesn't make it any less costly. So how do we know we're living with God's presence as a priority? The first thing, God's presence will move us to respond and worship. This is what King David has to say about Saul's reign. Saul was the king before David. In 1 Chronicles, it says, It is time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. See, before Saul became king, the Philistines had taken the ark from the Israelites. They believed that it would bring them good luck because they had seen that whatever battle that the Israelites went into with the ark, they won. So they took it, believing this is going to bring us all the same luck that it brought the people of Israel. And they found out it did not. It brought them nothing but plagues. In fact, the idol that they worshipped, Dagon, fell over and they found it the next day worshipping the ark. Then the following day they found it and it had fallen and broken. So they decided, we don't want this ark anymore. It's bringing us nothing but trouble. So they took it and left it in a field. But that meant that the people of Israel had access to the ark again. They had access to God's presence and Saul neglects it. He neglects God's presence and it's not surprising that he was not a very good king. So after the ark was rescued from the Philistines, we see David, he brings the ark to Obed-Edom's house for a few months. And that takes us to 2 Samuel 6. So this is after King David is reigning. And it says, Then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's house and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom's to the city of David with a great celebration. Try to say that many times, (laughs) Obed-Edom. I did practice that lots, guys. Um, After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and blowing of the ram's horn. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the special tent David had prepared for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. When he had finished his sacrifices, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Then he gave to every Israel man and woman in the crowd a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people returned to their homes. 
When David returned home to bless his own family, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michal, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as a leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, and I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I'm distinguished. So you have David... He, like I set up the story, right? He's bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. This is a really big deal. He's saying that we're going to put value on God's presence again. That's what he's doing. And so he's responding in worship because he's bringing God's presence back. And he is putting it as a priority. He's saying God is the king of Israel. And while he's doing this, He's sacrificing, right? He it says every six steps. Can you imagine? He's sacrificing. That's a lot. And then he's dancing. He's giving peace offerings. He's blessing the people. He's making this a big deal because it is a big deal. And he's declaring God's goodness over Israel. But his wife, who happens to be Saul's daughter, Unfortunately, she has the same dismissive attitude towards God's presence as her father did. She isn't thinking about God's presence. She's thinking about how embarrassing it is that her husband's out there dancing like that and looking like that out there. She's not thinking about what this means. She looked down upon David. But it's clear from the text that I just read that David is our role model. God's presence should move us to respond in worship. It should make us want to respond. If God's presence isn't making us respond, then maybe we need to go deeper to God's presence because when we are in God's presence, we don't take it for granted. When we're in his presence, we can't help but respond in worship. Because he's that good. So number one, God's presence will move us to respond in worship. The second thing is God's presence changes our perspective. It helps us see clearer. You know, when I was in my early 20s, I loved mountain climbing. And I'm not talking about like these small New York mountains. I'm sorry. But I lived in Montana and Alaska, and those mountains are huge. And we used to climb those mountains. And so I remember when we would climb those mountains, you would have all these switchbacks and things up the mountain. And you would be looking just to your next step. And it would, you wouldn't be able to see too much as you're climbing up the mountain. Just your initial, like, just um, what's around you, right? Like the trees around you, the trail around you. But when you would get to the top of the mountain... What could you see? I could see everything. I could see the whole trail that I just climbed. I could see all the houses, the whole entire city from that vantage point. And it was a different perspective. The perspective that I had before I got to the top, it was hard. It was hard work. I didn't know when I was going to get to the top of the mountain because I couldn't even see the top of it. It was all those switchbacks, and I was wondering when those were going to end. But when I get to the top, I can see everything. That's what the presence of God does. It helps us gain perspective. It helps us see things that we cannot see when we're surrounded by our own circumstances. And I know in my own experience, there have been moments when God hasn't moved like I thought he would. It looks different. It sometimes may appear even that he's let me down. There have been moments of grief There have been moments of uncertainty and moments of fear and disappointment. But it has been when I prioritize getting into God's presence that I am able to have my perspective elevated. Being in God's presence changes my perspective. It helps me get out of my surroundings and helps me to see clearer from a more eternal perspective. It helps change our perspective when we get in his presence. The things that are weighing us down suddenly are lifted because we can see it through 
his eternal eyes, just even a glimpse of it. So God's presence will move us to respond in worship. God's presence changes our perspective, and God's presence brings breakthrough. In Joshua 6, it says, So Joshua called together the priests and said, Take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assigned seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people, march around the town, and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horn started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns, and some behind the ark with the priests continually blowing the horns. Do not shout, do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout, then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Then Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they again marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests surrounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. This was seven days of marching around, quietly before the shout. It took them all day to walk around the town of Jericho. They would start in the morning and finish in the evening when they went back to the camp to rest. Then they would start again the next day, right? Breakthrough took time. It took days of marching around Jericho and carrying the ark while they worshiped. But they were surrounding Jericho with God's presence. They were surrounding it. It was God's presence that made Jericho Jericho fall. God's presence brings breakthrough because God's presence has power. God's presence has power. Some of us give give up after only spending a little bit of time in God's presence when he doesn't do what we want him to do. Maybe we need to spend more time in God's presence. Maybe we can't quite see what was happening. I would imagine that the Israelites, as they were marching around, couldn't quite see what God was doing. But it doesn't mean that he wasn't doing something. We need to be in God's presence. If there is something in your life that you are believing God for, you are trusting God for, then you need to be in God's presence. You need to sit with him. You need to go to him with those things and trust that he is working on your behalf. So one, God's presence will move us to respond and worship. The second thing, God's presence changes our perspective. Third thing, God's presence brings a breakthrough. And the fourth thing, pursuing God's presence should move us to unconditional worship. We are going to read from 2 Samuel, but this is after David had sinned by having Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, murdered so that he could take Bathsheba as his wife. This is what it says. It says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man, the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdom of Israel and Judah, and If that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of God and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. 
This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for the sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife. David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, but he refused. Then on the seventh day, the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him. He wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill. They said, but what drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? When David saw them whispering, he realized what, was ha what had happened. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshipped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. His advisors were amazed. We don't understand you, they told him. While the child was still living, you wept and you refused to eat. But now that the child is dead, you have stopped your mourning and are eating again. David replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive. For I said... Perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. <laughs> this didn't go how David had expected or how he hoped. He had hoped that God would spare his son, but he didn't. But what was the first thing he did after his son died? He got up, he washed himself, he went into the tabernacle and he worshiped. He knew where he needed to be. He needed to be in the presence of God. Even though his prayers weren't answered the way he had hoped. Even though he could have been just angry with God, he runs to the tabernacle. And it says his actions confuse the servants. This is what Charles Swindoll has to say. Many would, have, would stand in amazement at David's response. His child has just died. God answers, or God's answer to his seven-day prayer was a firm no. He heard the news. He arose, cleaned himself up, and went to the place of worship as if to say, God did this and God did that. I accept it from him without hesitation, and I will go on from here. Difficult as that may be for some to understand, that is an incredibly mature response. Remember, a contrite heart makes no demands and has no expectations. Sometimes we neglect God's presence in order to hold our worship hostage when things don't go the way we expect. We want to withhold our worship from God, but our worship should be unconditional, just as David's was. It is the first place that we should run to, as run straight into God's presence. And that's where we get that perspective change. See, David's perspective was different than his servants because he spent time in God's presence. He understood that one day he would get to see his son. His perspective was changing in God's presence. In Job, it says, Job stood up, and this is after he loses his family everything. And it says, he shaved his head and fell to the ground in worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. That he still worshiped God no matter what. But this goes both ways. Some of us only seek out God when life is difficult. We know when things get difficult, we can come to God. But when was the last time we sought God's pres our presence in a good day? Or maybe just a mundane day. A, just a day where everything is just kind of normal. A, a routine, regular, unremarkable day. We need, our worship needs to be all the time. 
our worship has to be unconditional. So God's presence will move us to respond in worship. His presence changes our perspective. It brings breakthrough and it moves us to have unconditional worship. The presence of God is transformative. In Mark, it says, Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She has suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Then, then, or she had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. We read a little earlier in Jeremiah that there was a promise of the Messiah that would mean people would have easier access to God's presence. This woman, she understood that. She was thinking to herself, I could just get in Jesus' presence. If I could just get to him, if, even if I could just touch the edge of his robe, my life would be changed. She was an outcast to society. It would have cost her so much to get into the presence of Jesus. She didn't care. She understood that if I can just get there, if I can just get there, then I could be healed. My life could be transformed. We need that same response. If I could just get into God's presence, maybe he would do this. If I could just get into God's presence, maybe I would find healing. Maybe if I just got into God's presence, that situation would change. Maybe if I just got into his presence, I could see things differently. We need that same response. It's as if Jacob said while he was wrestling with God, I will not leave until you bless me. I will not leave until I get from you what you want to give me. Our response needs to be the same. Maybe we need to spend some more time saying, God, I am not leaving your presence. I'm not going to leave your presence until I get what you want for me. Whether it's healing, whether it's a change in my circumstances, whatever it may be, some of us need to run into God's presence. We don't need to run to our, na our neighbors, our friends, our family members, our husbands, our whatever it might be, the thing that you pick up the phone and the person that you call first thing. Some of us need to run into God's presence because that is where we are transformed. That is where he does his work. That is where he shows us perspective. That is where healing takes place. If we become more aware of the presence of God and we value his presence and we make time for his presence, this is what we will gain in our life. We will gain consistent worship, perspective, breakthrough, unconditional worship, and transformation. If those things are missing in your life, you need to spend more time in God's presence. First Chronicles, we read this earlier, it says it is time to bring back the ark of our God for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. We don't want to be people who neglect the presence of God. Saul only accessed the presence of God when he was desperate and had nowhere else to go. We don't want to be like that. He didn't prioritize the presence of God and he wasn't a very good king. In Jude it says now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. God's presence keeps our eyes set on him. In God's presence, we reflect on him. It will always lead us to worship him, to declare how good he is regardless of our situations. That is where we see God's faithfulness in our life. It is where we reflect on what he has done for us. We need God's presence. We need to access it daily, moment by moment. And God is so good. He is so good that he'll take whatever he can get, whatever he can get, because he just wants to spend time with you. 
He just wants to, you to be in his presence. He wants you to know him more. We're gonna get ready to go back into worship and we're gonna sing this song. And I kind of wanna just go through some of the lyrics with you guys because it's about what we've been talking about. Here's the lyrics. It says, I'm gonna sing till my heart starts changing. I'm gonna worship till I mean every word. Cause the way I feel and the fear I'm facing doesn't change who you are or what you deserve. That's perspective. Even if you don't feel it, I'm gonna sing it. I'm gonna say it until I feel it. I give you my worship because you still deserve it. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy of my song. Cause he is so worthy. He is so worthy of our worship. Doesn't matter what you're going for. Do not withhold your worship from God. Do not withhold it. If you're going through the roughest day, or the most difficult season, don't withhold your worship from him. And then it says, I'm gonna live like my king has risen because we know he has risen. I'm gonna preach to my soul that you've already won. And even though I can't see it, I'm gonna keep believing that every promise you make is as good as done. I'm gonna trust him regardless of what everything else is telling me, regardless of what my situation says, I'm gonna trust him. I believe that he's victorious. So while we are singing this song, I'm gonna have everybody go ahead and you'd stand up. We're gonna go into worship. And when we go into that song, I want you to declare that song over yourself. Our prayer team is gonna come up. They're here to pray for you. If you need prayer, if you've never experienced the presence of God, they're here to pray for you. If you need more of his presence, they're here to pray for you. If you're going through a difficult situation where you're having a hard time seeing clearly, they're gonna pray for you. But we're gonna declare this song, even if we don't feel it, even if we're not sure we quite believe it, we're gonna sing this song and declare it over ourselves. <laughs> 